So now we're going to look, move on to the second part of this 10th lecture, lecture series for public management and take a more detailed look at the what is meant by auditing and internal control. Um, since we've encountered it in various guises uh, in previous cases in the class, but now we're going to be taking a more sustained look at internal control. So if you recall back um, to previous weeks, we've talked about these different ways in which organizations try to control and coordinate activity, right? So some of these are going to be through standard setting activities, like having policies or standard operating procedures. Some of this is going to be through active monitoring and enforcement, corrective action, quality control, um, managerial information systems. Often the sort of accounting and auditing will fall someplace on this side of, um, of uh, the spectrum. Though, of course, part of what you're going to see is they actually, auditing and accounting actually are going to look at all four quadrants in some way, shape, or form. There are also things like sort of setting some internal uh, controls through beliefs and skills or sort of culture, if you will, right? So this is things like internal communication, training, professionals, right? These are the ways, um, another way of sort of setting the right environment, if you will, for control. And then finally, we resource allocation itself can serve as a, a powerful means of control through planning and budgeting and staffing, issues we've actually been looking in more detail at in different weeks. So an internal audit then, uh, what the goal of it is, is that if you have an organization and you're at the very top, like you're the board, you're the senior management, and you're worried about how your organization is work, you need to have some way of knowing that your governance and risk management and internal control processes are operating effectively because it, it's, you can't just sort of take the word of the top managers, right? They could be lying, they could be um, misleading you, they might not even know themselves. So in essence, what um, organizations have moved to, towards in the U.S. and really throughout um, the sort of advanced industrial countries, but these types of um, procedures are spreading beyond that, is the idea of internal auditing, which are ways for organizations to self-regulate and can provide timely protection um, against reputational risks. And there are then chartered groups, say this is from this particular Definition is from the Charter Institute of Internal Auditors, but there are other similar organizations in many countries. So in other words, what the major goals of internal control are, are to basically provide reasonable assurance, again, to this sort of governance group, the executive board, um, uh, whatever the sort of top level governance is, um, as to the reliability of financial reporting, uh, whether or not the organizational goals, um, operational or strategic, are being achieved effectively and efficiently, and the extent to which the organization is actually complying with various laws and regulations. So that's the goal is basically not to necessarily give an assessment like it's, you know, uh, it can be hard sometimes to provide this, but basically the idea is you're providing assurance, right? So you can't guarantee something, but you can provide some level of assurance that these things should be working efficient, uh, efficiently and effectively or reliably. Um, internal control auditors tend to look at five major control systems. Again, these are going to co correspond fairly closely to the, um, the control systems that we've been looking at in previous week's lectures. So the environment is going to be things like the culture, it's setting the tone, it's the foundation. So sort of like do people, <laughs> yeah, culture is probably, it's this, this sort of internal norms and, and, and beliefs and norms that's quite important to control. Um, Risk assessment is looking at basically sort of concrete risks and how they should actually be um, managed. Information and communication is making sure that are people getting the information they need in order to do their jobs effectively. So we've run into a few places, right, where we've thought, oh, well, can this person actually go out and check and see whether or not um, a document has been written, well, they need to have some way to get information. So the idea of an internal auditor is they're doing very much like what we might do with our cases. They come in and look, are they getting the information they need to do their jobs effectively? Um, control activities are looking at the very specific um, policies and procedures that make sure that when somebody gives a directive, it's actually being followed out. Like how, what are the checks and balances, if you will, on those? So we've looked at some of this. It's basically internal regulation processes um, the one we've been looking at some is budgeting, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail in a second. 
And then of course, there's always this idea of monitoring. So basically, uh, are we sort of always checking, what are the, the processes that are used to assess this quality of an internal control performance? So how are we actually monitoring our internal controls? Um, just to give you a sense of how widespread the notion of auditing and internal control are, in the private sector, all public companies are required to actually include an internal control report. So this is, again, it's very much like auditing and accounting, but again, you can see that it goes beyond just double checking budgets to a wide range of um, assessments uh, of different aspects of organizational uh, operation. So you can see here again that there has to be some sort of uh, an opinion or an uh, assurance expressed, an opinion expressed on management's internal control. So the opinion basically is um, basically do you think it's effective or not? Um, and this is what we see that the opinions end up being quite pivotal in the case that we're looking at this week. So the idea then is that, that what, what an internal auditing control process does is the input's going to be some sort of information about operational programs. Some of this might be purely you know, numbers, budgets, amounts spent, expenditures, but some of it's going to be other types of information. You might actually put in um, work process flow charts, for example, um, or other things about failure rates or error rates, right? So there's all sorts of different information that go in. Um, the integ integrated internal control function is supposed to monitor and assess and correct. Um, so the idea again with integrated internal control is that it's actually taking place inside um, the, the organization itself as opposed to having these external auditors have to come in and do it. So there's actually um, internal controls that are constantly operating within an organization to provide assurances up the ladder to um, the, the governance body. And output is going to typically be some sort of a statement of assurance, an opinion, something like that, right? Um, it's basically an all things considered assessment, typically, of how reliable, effective, um, compliant the different aspects of the organization are. So when we think about internal regulation of expenditures, this is just sort of a rough breakdown of what, a generic breakdown of what this might look like is when we think about internal budget control, um, and we talked about this some, again, um, in the week on uh, Brazil in Action, is that we might be, say, tracking expenditures and documentation of those expenditures and matching that up to a budget, deciding, you know, whether or not those things match or not. If there are anomalies, if something is lacking documentation, if more was spent on one project than was supposed to be, et cetera, those can get investigated. And then basically also within that process, there's going to be some sort of a... Um, uh, if you think about the first three is sort of re related to monitoring um, and identifying anomalies, then this last function is all about sort of imposing some sort of penalty, which will usually either be pausing future funds or clawing them back, i.e. actually in some way getting back the money, um, depending on the, whether it's an internal or sort of cross uh, multi-level organizations, clawback becomes more of an issue. So just to be clear then, what the in European Court of Auditors is, is while it's within the EU, it technically speaking is actually external to uh, the commission and its organizations, right? So they're actually serving in a sense as external auditors. And what they do is, again, it's a court, um, and it's supposed to be auditing the accounts of all EU institutions, and it's comprised, like everything else in the EU, as a member from each EU member state. and Basically, a lot of their work is on budgeting and management policies or other policies, particularly in areas relating to growth and jobs, added value, public finances. So they're basically looking to see whether or not the policies are effective or not in these various areas. And the ECA is auditing the budget both in terms of revenue and its spending, right? So they're looking at both sides, where the money is coming from and then how it's going back out. Um, we're going to be looking a lot at the expenditure side um, and comparing it to the budget in this week's case. So what comes out of this process, as I said before, is basically something like a declaration of assurance. So in essence, are they finding errors or not in these um, audited expenditures? And if they find um, errors of any sort, then you get a negative declaration of assurance. You say, there's no way we can be comfortable or confident that this is a reliable um, financial process. And in 2015, just to give you a sense, it was its 21st consecutive um, 
negative statement of assurance. So there's basically never been a positive uh, DAS for um, the European budget. You can imagine that's not great <laughs> news. Um, so part of what's happening is that even a, a below that, they might still be able to endorse the handling of the budget. And what you can find is that there have been certain years where the courts actually basically refused to endorse the handling of the budget. The first was in 1984, but then it happened again in 1999, which is what led to the Santerre Commission resignation, um, resignation the, the thing that sort of set off the SCPU case in the previous week. And that's, of course, important because, as I pointed out before, with the commission, there were specific expenditures they identified that were actually quite scandalous, but not necessarily all of them, but the whole commission still had to resign. So just to give you a sense, these are the, the estimated error rate in the structural and agricultural funds. Um, so this is money basically spent on social welfare and agricultural uh, subsidies in essence. And so the estimated error rate, you can see it actually comes down fairly substantially from 2007 to 2009. Um, it never, even the lower bounds never quite make it down to 2%. Um, and then after 2009, it sort of goes up a little bit and it maybe seems to come back down some. So it's useful to sort of see that based on audits, this is what you have. I, I will point out that it's important to keep in mind what the error rate means. It doesn't mean that the funds were misappropriated. It typically means that the documentation isn't available, that they can't be sure that money was spent on a specific thing or not. And I should also point out that in my own experience with the EU, the threshold for which substantial documentation has to be um, included is quite low. So basically any expenditure, like of, with almost no exceptions, you know, if you spend $10 on something or 10 euro, you know, five euro, you still have to include it. There is a slight allowance where they actually allow per diem if you're traveling. So that makes it a little bit easier, but you can imagine that people might accept expenditures and depending, you, one of the things that we know about the EU is because it's multi-level, you have, you know, thousands of organizations, each of them with their own internal budgeting person who may or may not decide to issue a reimbursement. So every single time there's a piece of paper missing, that is a, an error. And so the error rate can end up creeping up quite high without it actually meaning that there is any type of scandalous undertone to the way, um, to the disbursement of funds.